See, we don't realize when we lose hope in our lives. We don't realize when we become victims because it's like a disease. It's the de- it's like a disease of your soul and you don't realize it until a wake up call. And I'm like, holy crap. He's right. Because what, what did I, I felt I tried it all. I felt I was the victim. I felt that these were the genetic cards I was given. And I did not realize I was in a victim, hopeless mentality. I'm like, oh my God, he's right. I would have my health if I tried everything. This is the Anthropology Podcast, the podcast where we optimize the bodies, brains, and lifestyles of entrepreneurs, go getters, and world changing innovators. Welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. I'm your host, Dr. Megan Walker. As an anthropologist and naturopathic doctor, I optimize the health and performance of badass women working to change the world as entrepreneurs and go-getters. You know, people exactly like you. Your business, body, balance, and inner badass. These are the themes that we are exploring. Before we jump into the interview, I want to invite you to join our free Facebook community, Legacy. If you want to be something amazing, you need to surround yourself with amazing people. The legacy community is made up of badass women living, not leaving, but living our legacy every single day. We are leaders, parents, entrepreneurs, and innovators collectively committed to leaving the world better than we found it. My mission is to support the health and optimization of these badass superheroes, literally to places we never thought imaginable. If you are on a mission and get it that your health is the key to your unlimited potential, then join us. We are super awesome. You can find us on Facebook at www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash DE legacy. See you there. Today's guest is someone I met through a mutual friend in a mastermind group that we are all a part of. And when I mentioned that I was looking to explore the concept of the hero's journey on the podcast, my friend David Bin said, I know just the person that you need to connect with. When I checked out the website of Dr. Chris Zeno, the very first thing that I saw was a quote from him that said, I liberate heroes. Dr. Zeno is a, is a chiropractor. He is a hero himself. He is someone who has walked the hero's journey. As a Mr. America in 1998, he thought he was on top of the world until a deadly disease set him back. His own personal experience is exactly what gives him the power and the fuel to change people's lives the way he has. He's built enormous practices and has now shifted away to be able to work with people one-on-one to help them free the hero that resides inside of them. He helps people reach their full potential and he's going to do the same for you. It is my pleasure to introduce you to Dr. Chris Zeno. Dr. Chris Zeno, welcome to the Anthropology Podcast. Thank you so much, Megan, and thank you for everybody for listening. Well, I'm 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 super excited to get into this. And when I was originally introduced to you, I, I did what what all of us do upon those introductions. I dug in deep to learn more about you. Um, and as I pulled up one of your websites, it says right on the front that you liberate superheroes. And I was like, oh, I love this man already. Take us through the journey that got you to a place where that is where you understood that's what you were about. Right. Uh, let's go back in my many lives. Well, let's go back to 1998. That's probably the best. So in 1998, I was 21 and I just won Mr. America. So I had this really cool title and I was a personal trainer and I just, and then the same year graduated my degree in exercise phys. So I started my little career with a lot of cool stuff, you know, fitness magazines, writing for bodyboom.com. And I lived in Orlando, Florida. And back in the day, if those of you over 30, you'll remember there was a show called Xena warrior princess and Hercules, right? So they were very popular. And that was the first time when the actors really had to have that gladiator warrior look. So I was the trainer for, um, on the set and they did most of their filming in New Zealand and in Universal Studios, Florida. And I trained a lot of the Orlando magic as well, personally. So I had a great, I mean, it was awesome. It was just a career I would definitely do. And, uh, you know, in times in our lives we're like, Hey, we're set. And I just need to maintain this forever. And at 26, I'm wearing my wife with me. And then six months to a marriage, uh, a huge unknown in my life happened where I just started going to the bathroom a lot. thought I had a stomach bug and it didn't go away. And it got worse and worse. And I started bleeding every time I went to the bathroom. I'm getting nervous and 15, 16, 18 times a day going to the bathroom, losing weight, bleeding. 
And I'm hiding this from a lot of people because I just, that's what I do. And, and at 26, at that time of my life, like any, any issue that ever happened, it just kind of went away on its own, but this wasn't. So I went on Google and I typed in blood and stool and sure enough, uh, cancer pops up. I'm like, oh man. And I'm scared because my dad died of cancer when I was 21. Uh, my grandfather I never met. And I was raised in the belief up until that point in my life that health was kind of uh, the DNA you were given and whatever that DNA said, or, or how about this? It, uh, the defects in your DNA, DNA will determine your health because I really felt we had no control over it. That's just the way I was raised in the American medical model. And uh, I was like, well, I, I didn't think this would happen at 26. So I just went into denial, didn't think about it. And they got to the point where my whole life was really being dictated by these issues and condition and experience. And then the day my wife found out was the day I couldn't hide it anymore. I was at a department store and I would do my routine, go in the store and where's the bathrooms? Cause you always had the urgency to go and they were under construction and it was like a T it was a TJ Maxx, a little department store here. And so I was trying to get out of the store to go to the next building where there's a bathroom. I didn't make it. And in front of about 40 people, I lost my bowels in public. That was the first of many times, by the way, but the first time it was so difficult was it was like rock bottom. I mean, just my entire identity of Mr. America and this health per it was just, I found myself at a TJ Maxx losing my bowels in public. And it was, you couldn't hide it. It was blood. It was mucus. People were shocked because no one, no one's ever seen that. And, but they also have empathy. And I just realized in the moment, while my entire identity, who I was, was totally ripped apart, ripped away from me and taken from me. And I ran out the side uh, loading dock and I called my wife and she's like, what? And, you know, so we went to the hospital and they diagnosed me with an incurable terminal disease called ulcerative colitis. And they put me on a ton of medication. The medication gave me hepatitis and I was on organ rejection drugs. I was on chemo. I was on interferon. I was, I mean, you name it. And I had really great doctors, a team of four doctors. And uh, all it did was you saw me go from 230 pounds down to about 158 pounds in about four months. Nothing's working. And now the only option I'm giving, the one and only option is within a week, they set me up for surgery to remove my colon. Uh, they said I would still have an 80% chance of cancer. They don't know if I would make it through the surgery because I wasn't on, on an organ. I was on three organ rejection medications. So if you're listening, an organ rejection medication is this. God forbid you ever have to have an organ transplant. Your body would automatically start to attack this foreign organ. And so they give you a drug that lowers and really shuts down your immune system at the level of the DNA. So it just, uh, it still fights it, but it might take years instead of days. And so they're like, but the problem is we're going to rip out your colon and take it out. And you're on three organ rejection medications. I just, you're like a bubble boy. I, I mean, the, you're still going to be some in, in probably intensive care for months. And uh, then they said I was sterile. I said, well, can I donate sperm? They're like, no, you're already sterile. And I'd be on $5,000 worth of medication the rest of my life. It just, the, the only option was not good, but I'm the person that's like, hey, I'll do, you know, I'm going to be coachable. Like, hey, I got to do it. So I flew home to see my mom. And now here's my mom. So my mom lost my dad. She lost two sons already, one from a freak accident, one from a heroin overdose that she found. And, uh, you know, it's affecting her life. I mean, this is her third, you know, the, the, the fourth man in her life that's going to be taken away. And then she writes the prayer email that every mom, you know, does help, right? And then everybody is praying that the surgery goes well. And then my anatomy teacher from 10th grade uh, says, I want to see Chris when he comes home. And so I flew home. I saw my anatomy teacher. I'm like, what are you doing here? And uh, if you guys are listening, remember, always pay attention to when you're going through a tough time, the opportunities, the people, the song, the movie, the book you're reading, like that something may come across your life that changes your perspective in such a way that it may turn the whole thing around. And so my anatomy teacher says, listen, I need you to go see my doctor who's a corrective care chiropractor. It'll change your life. And I looked at him truly insulted. I was like, listen, I just did the best. I was the best in the world. I appreciate you caring for me, but I've tried everything. And he said, no, you didn't try everything because if you tried everything, you would have had your health. And I sat there and what was crazy, Megan, when he told me that, see, we don't realize when we lose hope in our lives. We don't realize when we become victims because it's like a disease. It's, the de it's like a disease of your soul and you don't realize it until a wake up call. And I'm like, holy crap, 
He's right because what, what did I I felt I tried it all. I felt I was the victim. I felt that these were the genetic cards I was given. And I did not realize I was in a victim, hopeless mentality. I'm like, oh my God, he's right. I would have my health if I tried everything. So I saw this doctor. He taught me how the body was created, heal, and function, like all of us, past in biology. And uh, he showed me my spine, and it was my blind spot. So my blind spot, you know, my, my spine was severely damaged in my lower spine, even though I didn't have any pain. But all those nerve roots coming out of your spine went to my digestive system and other, other areas of my spine were damaged, crushing my brain stem, 50% pressure on my brain stem, where your immune systems are. And still, though, you see now I see a blind spot. So now it's great to see blind spots we didn't know about. So now uh, there is something we didn't try. But I was scared and I was fearful. And this was just somebody else giving me some false hope. And then I asked him this question. I go, so what am I going to get better? Because in life, when we have an issue, we just we want it over. And the way he answered it was the reason why I chose this path. He goes, listen, as long as you have this problem here, that's interfering with your body's ability to heal. He goes, you're, our natural state as human beings is well-being. And that's the natural state of our health. He goes, as long as that problem's there, when you decide to correct, and he put it all on me, Meg, what I loved about it. He literally, he, he did not care that I felt like I was a victim. He put 100% responsibility on me. He's like, when you choose to correct your problem that you have that's affecting your life and your future, then your body will be in the environment to be able to heal itself. And then it'll be able to heal. He's like, but the day and the hour that you're asking me that you'll get better. He's like, that's not up to me. That's up to you. And he goes, but I will tell you, you will get well if you don't quit on yourself, no matter how long it takes. Again, put, put it right on my court. So I had to make a choice. My wife knew that going for the surgery and, and definitely, you know, no family, this and that would not be what we wanted. And uh, we didn't have the money, right? I had all this debt. But again, when you really want something, even though it's not in the bank account, you find it. We found it. And uh, I wish I could tell you, Megan, it was uh, after the first week. It was a miracle. Seven months later, um, which was tough. Because imagine, like, if you guys are listening, you're going through a tough time or you want a circumstance in your life to change. And every day you're being reminded of the circumstance you don't want anymore. Even though you're making changes in your life. And imagine seeing blood every single day, every single day, and it's reminding you of ways and not where you want to be. But in six months, I was completely off the medication, no more blood, uh, avoided surgery. My body healed itself from an incurable terminal disease called ulcerative colitis. And uh, Megan, that unknown in my life, I went back to school. I became a chiropractor because that was like my purpose at that point. Uh, my wife and I opened up our office in 2005. We became the largest clinic in the history of the profession. Uh, we saw over 2,800 people per week at our peak. Wow. And the average office sees 100. So, you know, the uh, it definitely was a, a mission and a purpose. And then, Megan, I, I, I hit another point in my life, and then we'll segue to any questions. But then I hit another point in my life where I remember I was 35 years old and I checked off all the boxes, Meg. It's like I had a successful practice. All my human needs were met. We were, we were financially secure, uh, no debt whatsoever. Uh, I had a beautiful, a beautiful wife I could, that was healthy that I could take care of. I have two beautiful boys I was promised I would never have that were healthy and strong. I have a profession where I'm pouring in and help changing other people's lives. I speak all over the world, wrote the book. I mean, I a Lamborghini in the garage, like, Megan, we did it. And then I realized that uh, why am I feeling depressed? Why am I feeling numb? So, and this is kind of... Uh, where the whole uh, hero journey started. So up until this point, any questions? And then we'll go into uh, present time. No, I, I was just listening with, with really like captivating attention to what you were saying, because um, you, you mean you're describing the hero's journey, right? And, and which I feel like is the journey of, of purpose-driven people. So it, it made sense to me when those words started to percolate up to the top of your, your story. I don't really have a question more that I just wanted to, I wanted to pull attention to one thing that you said um, in the description of your story. And thank you for sharing that was that our natural state of health is actually well-being. And um, it reminded me over the last few weeks, I sat down with some family members and we were chit-chatting and, and as, as this happens, and I'm sure you have the same thing, they're like, can I just show you my list of medications to see what's going on? And we were going through that and I was looking at this list of like 20 different medications and I was like, ah, like your natural, like your body wants to take you back to a state of, of health. Um, and I think one of the things that's so profound about the story that you just shared is that with 
the right amount of effort and, and guidance, there is, there is a capacity to get there. And yet we have a system, both in the U.S. and Canada, that, that does not necessarily lend itself um, to taking people along that, uh, along that journey. And I'm actually really excited to jump into a little bit more about how you work with people to really like break down this preconceived notion that health is only attainable through all the pills that you line up in the morning, that life has so much pressure well, exactly. coming at you. Yeah, you know. yeah. I was just gonna say that you can't, the only way to survive life is on medication because it's just so darn hard to stay healthy, which is the most disempowering uh, perpetuation of untruth that I think we have floating around out there. Anyways, it wasn't a question. I'm just like, I'm cheering you on, Chris, because um, it's it's so sad that more people don't get to have the realization you had. Oh, Megan, and that, and that, and that was really why we became uh, one of the largest uh, clinics in, in my profession was because exactly what you just said. And, and it really, you could see how just what I'm doing today is just an evolution of that. It was an amazing thing, Megan, to sit in front of a group of people and say, hey, and I would say, listen, this is not a religious statement, but can we all agree? You started as two cells, and in nine months, you were 70 trillion cells of this beautiful baby that we call the miracle of what? I'm like, oh, it's the miracle of life. I'm like, yeah. So do we all agree there was some type of innate wisdom, guidance? I mean, whatever you, the syntax you want to use for it, but like, we all know it wasn't random. And everybody's like, yeah, absolutely. So they see this, this birthing, two cells to 70 trillion. They see this nine months of gestation as a miracle. And I go, so when you were born, you know, that same wisdom and intelligence that made your heart and made your colon and made your eyeballs. I'm like, so... Everything that, you know, did this beautiful symphony of creating you when you were born, where to go? And make to see uh, people stare at you like Scooby-Doo because you realize in the moment I'm about to make them remember something that I believe we were all distracted of. And they're like, I, you know, and they start getting, I'm like, so did it come out with the placenta? They're like, no. And they're like, I, I they're like, I, it's still there. And I'm like, yeah. It's still there. And I go, so what's the difference between you and a baby? And they're like, I'm like, nothing. So you're just a bigger baby. So I go, explain to me the day. Can you remember the day that you were distracted enough by lies and institutions that you, you tell me the day you forgot that you were the miracle? Because that's what it is. And so now today, as you know, like, uh, you know, pregnancy is now considered a medical condition medical condition. I'm like, and I go back to, I'm like, it is the most primitive form of reproduction. We wouldn't be here as a race if it was that dangerous, you know, it's just like, so I think we're taught something to believe that we were born, we were born in a deficit and we need to climb up to do something to maybe get health. And maybe we're like, almost health is lucky uh, versus not realizing that well-being is and always will be the natural state of the body. Like, like darkness, light, you know, like darkness is the absence of light. And people don't realize that sickness or disease is just the absence of proper functioning. It's not a thing. And people say, like, cancer is not a thing, guys. You got to understand it's the result of a dysfunction of the body. It's a, it's a result of interference of well-being of the body, uh, of an adaptive process of the body. So, like, if we, we're starting to chase these things that are labeled, but we're not looking to, well, how do we restore well-being to its natural state again? So, I'm uh, I'm... I'm with you all the way on that one. Yeah. And I suspect like, so we have a lot of, we have a lot of practitioners who uh, hang out uh, with our podcast and some of them are just like, they're killing it. Like they would stand on a mountaintop and espouse all the things that we're talking about. And then others are really, there are some who are struggling and there are some who are really trying to find their mark. How do we like, I feel like anytime if we opened our mouths and started to talk about this, about going upstream and address, addressing the root cause of disease and the fact that you have an opportunity to be well, people flock to that message. How do you get not not your patients, but fellow practitioners to tap in to that purpose and passion? Because we need more evangelists on the mountain. Megan, it's a hundred percent experience. See, words don't teach, and you know this. So we could study, and we could take all our part four boards, and we could we could le learn and cram. Uh, but when you know, when you and I work with people, we realize that um, people people's bodies they didn't read the textbook that we got tested on. 
You know, it's not like, oh, these are the presentations of a person. So we get so focused on the disease process. We're never really focused on, well, the natural state is well-being. I mean, I, and I always go back to the simplicity. It's almost like we're, there's so much complexity out there that we, once you get through all the complexity, you go back to being simple, like, hey, you cut your finger and it healed and you didn't, you didn't your, your, your innate intelligence took care of that, like, like something that simple. Uh, happen. So I just kind of ground it, but experience is the best teacher. And uh, Dr. Meg, when you work with people and you have seen people's body, and, and I want to be very clear on this, Dr. Meg and I will never ever say that we healed anybody. The only person that I could heal is myself. And so just to see people, to get in a state of interference is removed and their well-being is restored and their body goes to the actual normal state it was created to be in. And we've seen that uh, the first couple of times we saw that, or I saw that, I'm like, ooh, that's cool. Maybe it's a little bit of lucky, right? Because that's, that's, you know, I, but when you see it hundreds of times and when you see, when you really start to say, hey, experience is more important, is a greater teacher to me than some type of research paper, experience became the thing that really just truly brought out, brought out my heart. So my heart and my hands started to speak versus uh, my, my, limited, my limited beliefs that I was raised with. You know, I've seen it. I've seen everything. And to see that and to see people's lives change or see people that were told they would be, have no more hope again, to see people that are, uh, they were, their bodies were able to come off medication uh, that they said they'd be on the rest of their life, for people to avoid surgery that they said they had to have, for people to have a quality of life that they never thought people had possible. When you start to see that over and over and over again by looking to cause, and I don't know for the practitioner listening, I don't know if it's the 10th person or the 10,000th person, but there will come a day when you realize, ah, so life and experience taught me uh, my conviction for sure. Yeah. And I, I, I totally agree with you on that piece. And, and for anybody, whether you're a practitioner or you're moving through life, I mean, talking to people about their purpose and connecting people to purpose, I have found in my practice is the single biggest determinant um, of whether someone is actually going to get well. Because when there's something on the other side of health, then there, there's something to strive for. So how do you get people, because I suspect part of your process is not just talking about physical health, but really connecting people to their, their noble qualities and unique abilities. And these are words that I pulled from your site. How do you get people to connect to that as part of their healing journey? Right. So I found that, you know, as, as a practitioner, I was kind of staying the technical side of things and adjusting, you know, as a chiropractor, adjusting the spine. And I just kept on remembering, like, so that I called innate intelligence, that inboard intelligence that created them, you know, I remove interference and uh, their body heals. But I'm like, well, wait a second. Am I being myopic? Am I only, am I only addressing this inborn wisdom uh, on a physical standpoint? I'm like, how about that great idea that person gets? How about the inspired thought? That person gets how about that that uh, feeling of love and appreciation that person gets i'm like isn't that the same wisdom intelligence in that person and i'm, I'm just looking at a physical side of it so i realized that um just doing the technical part of it like i could adjust anybody but like you said if they don't if they don't have a, a heart change if they don't have a a mind change because i believe that when you find yourself in a situation it's a it's a series of variables that you chose to whether knowingly or not knowingly, and it's a recipe you lived and that recipe got you those results. And so what I help people do is I help them change those little variables. Uh, it might be broken philosophy of what health was. It might be uh, errors in judgment when it came to their health, such as health is how I look or how I feel. You know, that's the big one people think, but you don't feel heart disease and cancer. So when you realize like these errors in judgments and philosophies, if we get exchanged for easy lifestyle disciplines and, and time, and, and, and show blind spots they didn't realize were there. So I, I help people with that. But then I realized if the mind did not change, if the, you know, like if the purpose wasn't there, for, because what happens when someone gets better, then they would go back to the same equation. They would, uh, hey, I feel good now. So I'm just going to go back to the same recipe that got me here. And I wasn't, uh, I knew that the long-term change, I had to work on that aspect. And then I went through that myself. You know, so in practice, I started feeling heavy. I started, and what I mean, and if you're listening, notice when I'm, I'm now describing feelings, and this is how we, you know, hopefully you could apply this to yourself. So I came from this on purpose, like didn't need an alarm clock to wake up. I went to the office. I felt like I had lightning bolts come out of my hand, 
literally truly trying to save the world in my town. And then over time, I started getting numb. I started getting disengaged. I started feeling heavy, like I had moon boots on. Like I just could explain these emotions because I couldn't put them into words. And I didn't want to tell, I mean, who am I going to talk to without someone saying I'm ungrateful? I wasn't ungrateful. I was just something was, there was like this unfinished business. There was this thing going on. And uh, I hit it because I seemed to do pretty well. And uh, one day I was in my office at home and my son, Justice, my oldest son, I hear him go, hey, mom, he goes, what happened to daddy? And he said in such a way, Megan, that he was like, what happened to this world changer, world saver, on fire, on purpose, dad that I had? And that's exactly what he meant. It wasn't like, you know, but he, because my child was able to see something that I couldn't hide. And I knew I couldn't hide anymore. Uh, so I actually uh, reclused a little bit for a couple days. You know, uh, I got in some saunas, you know, I read, I read sauna. I just said, listen, I'm going to question my purpose. I'm going to really get down on my why. I'm in there going, why do I do what I do? I'm like, well, I want to help people. But you know what? My, it's, it sounded like a success one-on-one answer. Why do I want to, I want to see people reach the potential. Yeah, still a success. And what I mean by success one on one answer, it's when you get answered or asked a question and the answer sounds really good to everybody, but it's like, no, no, Chris, you got to be, what is your deal? And I was just so frustrated. And then this came out of me. I said, I just want to be admired for achieving great things and doing something in the world contribution wise that's never seen before. That's why. And it was such a selfish thing, but my heart actually like, moved. Like I felt there was no more calluses. I felt like I was, I was getting somewhere. So my body's giving me these words. So I got on my phone and I typed in admiration, contribution, achievement. I'm going on Google seeing what are these words meaning? Cause I know like I'm, it's very tough to figure yourself out. <laughs> and then I'm, I'm getting these words. I'm scrolling down. And I see the definition of hero. So now the definition of hero is one who is admired or idolized for courage contribution, amazing achievement and nobility. Megan, when I saw that, like I felt, here's it, watch, watch what I'm going to say, guys. I felt like a little child again. Something like, you know what, just think when you see a kid, they get happy, they get excited, like something got so excited in me and I realized, holy cow, I like was awoken to the fact that, that that's been the theme my entire life. And I said, and then in that moment, I believe that that has been on the inside of everybody their entire lives. You know, for me personally, I was the kid in the superhero pajamas. I worked out to look like a superhero. You know, I won Mr. America. I won Mr. Universe to have a superhero title. I beat a life-threatening terminal disease to go on, become a doctor to what? Go save lives. So in that definition of hero, I had uh, the achievements and I had the contributions, but this was it. I, I didn't have the courage to allow myself to become and expand, to become the person I was always created to be. And because I and a lot of us, I found my identity in what I did. I let what I did or what I was associated with become my identity. And so being Dr. Zeno, that's why when you asked, what, what do you want your name to be? And hopefully now you understand. I'm like, it really does. It doesn't make a difference to me anymore because it did in the past, Megan. Like, uh, if, you, if you're wondering what I meant by that, Dr. Megan said, hey, listen, do you want to be called Chris or Dr. Zeno? I'm like, Honestly, it does, maybe doctor adds credibility, but I really, when I said I, it doesn't matter to me anymore, it's because, and I mean it in such a way because that title, it created such an identity to me that for me to answer my call, to make a, an expansion in the world or to be a thought leader and extend my reach even outside the health and wellness field to help people with their minds and their purpose, it meant me leaving the comfort and the torment of my identity. And therefore, I realized the reason why I didn't move forward is because I would just get scared. Because I felt like if I move out, I lose my identity and I, lo I lose who I am. Just like I did before me. Remember, I was Mr. America, all this stuff. So I lost all my muscle, right? So I, I went through that before. I went through losing my identity before. And it sucked because you're stripped down. And so I just got scared. I mourned. And then when I realized, when, when, when you realize you're living half your potential, or half your life, the other half of your life of potential that you truly created to be, do, and have, it will torment you for the rest of your life. And so all these emotions, when I say pay attention to the words I'm saying, numb, disengaged, uh, crisis, uh, you know, uh, I was none of those things. I was never depressed. It was, 
those terms, I was trying to reach for the word the whole entire time. And if you're listening right now, you'll know I'm talking to you because the way what I'm about to tell you is going to hit you right in the heart. I wasn't numb, depressed or disengaged. I realized that I was grieving my potential the entire time. And then in that moment, I decided to embrace who I really was, embrace my, what I call my hero, your hero. Your hero is a true, authentic version of you. It's, it's the life, it's the person that you are that is not dictated by the imposed values of other people or society. You know, I, re, I lived my life according to other people's values, what that they thought that would be good, but I never asked myself, who's Chris? What's Chris want? What's Chris like? What's Chris's desires? And then I started the I Am Hero Project, and uh, it's just been an amazing uh, ride. You know, so working with people uh, through my four-step methodology called Hero Rises, we have seen uh, people find the courage by pursuing careers according to their purpose, uh, just like I did. Uh, the courage to heal and restore their families like it did mine. And when you find the courage to go out and do what you were passionately or purposely created to do, it gives you, like remember I said, you guys remember I said, I felt like a child jumping up and down. It gives you a new sense of joy, energy, hope, and purpose because you allowed yourself to step in and embrace the unknowns and embrace the excitement of who you were always created to be. Yeah. I love what you just described there. And I, I feel like this is a theme in some of the events we've run lately and different things that we've got going on on our side where people have been talking about this transition from doing things because you care what the outside world thinks to really moving inwards and satisfying those, the, like the depth of those inner, inner desires and those unique abilities and those noble qualities and that, like you could hear in people's language, the transition that's taking place. I could, I mean, I could hear it in yours. Um, and I agree with you with respect to the title. It really is, is somewhat meaningless to me at this point, although I'm unapologetically a naturopathic doctor, not because I care about the doctor piece, but because I, I resonate with the philosophy. Um, and it's, it, that has certainly been a transition for me. And I, I hear the same thing in you and it's, it's incredibly liberating to let go of caring about what other people think or finding your satisfaction from the external world. Oh, it's just been an amazing thing. And, and it's tough. It's tough when you do have a career that's really good, right? So it's a very tough thing because, you know, there's the security, there's the benefits, there's the income. And it's very easy to be like, hey, I don't want to start this whole journey again. You know what? And then people, and they, 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 uh, they, they put on the secret identity. It's just that less than watered down version of their truth. And it's comforting. It's tormenting but it's never fulfilling. And what I see uh, in both sexes, you know, you start to see when you start dealing in this, what I call the secret identity to distract yourselves from the truth. Cause I'll tell you what happens. It's not an easy journey because when you do a lot of times to distract yourself from this pain, from this feeling, cause these feelings are your heroic guidance system. You're like I said, no, you're not depressed. See the opposite of depression is expression. You're not depressed. Your body's telling you, what are you not expressing? Like, so we're, 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 and then we distract these things. So like Dr. Megan said, like, so then we turn to medications, we turn to alcohol, we turn to drugs, we turn to affairs, we turn to uh, self-destructive things, food, gamble, whatever it may be, because we're trying to distract ourselves, even social media, we, we distract ourselves from actually having to face the truth. Because when you go through this and it's not a midlife crisis, it's just a crisis of self. And this could happen at 13, it could happen at 80, but what, what a crisis of self is, is when your secret identity, which is, it's basically, you know, through society, you know, I always say teachers, preachers, institutionalized systems, media, everything, like we, we put on this false suit to conform and fit in and we became, we become somebody or something. And then that's that secret identity. And so when you go to this crisis of life, when you choose to go through it, because it is a choice, you know why? Because at the other end, you're not going to see or meet the person that you think you wanted to be or think you should be. The beauty is you're actually going to meet and be reintroduced. Always, uh, I say rediscover, reintroduced to the person that you were always created to be. And for some of you that are listening, such as myself, it means that you change a lot of things that you lived your life up, you know, good things, bad, you know, what? It, it's really not a good or bad issue, but it's, there's change involved. 
but the freedom, the happiness, the child, I go as go the childlike quality, which is the excitement, the, uh, the, the living in vertical time again, not linear time, all these beautiful things that you reattain beat every possible ulterior situation of staying in the comfort and torment of that secret identity. And I, I have two questions for you. One, I want to get a sense of what your, what you, like, as you discovered the side of yourself, what were the, what were the superpowers that you're like, oh gosh, who knew I had this like core unique set of skills that in hindsight, you're like, ah, oh, that's actually helped to accelerate where, where I went. What were some of those things that you, that you discovered for yourself? It was so powerful. Um, everybody has them. If you're listening, you have them all. So the, what I'm, what, it's very different. I'm not a personal development guy because I think personal development tells you what you still need. Like you need something from the outside in. I'm just trying to tell you to remember. So it's about being, like I say, re- to remember. So we have signposts in our lives uh, and that we don't realize because we, a lot of times our superpowers we take for granted because they're easy to us and we don't see them as a superpower because we're so critical on ourselves. So uh, when I went through this, uh, the, I, I could just go through a couple things. The uh, I call it the hero secret sauce. But first thing is you embrace the hero mindset. So that's just remembering that you are the hero. You're embracing the I am. Like this is, you know, I am. You know, like you declare who you are. Like you're not a victim. You are whatever that purpose is. And then you choose uh, and you maximize your superpowers. So knowing what your superpowers and then go on the emotion of it. You know, what is something that you love to do that you don't need an alarm clock to wake up for? Uh, what is the thing that when you're doing it, uh, time flies by? You have more energy like this podcast we're doing. I have way more energy now than I had when I started. You know, what's the thing that you could you could forget to eat? What is the thing that if you gave me a hundred million dollars, I'm still going to be doing it? What is the thing that most people come up and ask you and talk to you about? What is the thing that you could talk all night about? And whatever those things are, start distilling. Wow, this is how you find yourself in that. Also, another thing is. You know, who are the people you admire? Who's your favorite superhero? Who's your favorite celebrity? Who's your favorite author? And the reason why I do this is a lot of times, Megan, if I asked you, well, you're you're pretty self-aware right now, but a lot of people say, well, I don't know. Because you might be saying, well, I just don't know what I want to do. or I don't know what I like. So I have an exercise where I say, well, who's your favorite superhero? Who's your favorite singer? Who's your favorite celebrity? Who's your favorite writer? Who's your favorite person? And then they're like, oh, and they start labeling off these people. And when you find and you admire someone, you're actually admiring your vibrational matching uh, qualities. So, and it's funny, like when I say, who's your favorite superhero, three people could say Superman, but I say, so what about Superman? And you will get three totally different answers of characteristic traits. And when I ask people that, I call it reflection. You're actually reflecting your true characteristic traits in others. It's mirroring, so to speak. So we, we really pin that down and then Megan. So now what we do, okay, this is what I want to do. This is what I love. Like when I, when I'm doing this, I'm in my zone and I feel like when you're in the zone, you have, you have literally the only way I can describe it. You tapped into the universal energy that literally moves the universe. There's no other way I could explain it. It's like, you're thinking higher, like right now, like I'm sweating and I didn't even do cardio. It's like my body, my cells are just in such a great state because I'm, I'm in my lane and, and here's the thing, it's, it's better than any drug, it's better than it, there's no depression right now, right? There's like, you're, you're in the ultimate version of yourself, so why wouldn't you always want to be in that area? And so now to stay in that area, we have to choose our vehicle. So a lot of people have different vehicles to get your message out and your story. Mine is video, this I found out, mine was video and speaking. For some of you, it's writing. How do you know it's writing? You love to journal, you like to write your thoughts down, then yours is writing, you're amazing at that. Some of you, it's voice podcasting, radio. So you find that vehicle to be able to get and express your message out and the way you craft it. Because see, what, what I told you is like when you're doing it, how do you feel? Friggin' amazing, right? So what I did is when I built the I Am Hero project, I did a Facebook Live because it's video and it's speaking, right? I did, I did a Facebook Live 200 days in a row, every single day. And I would speak about the concepts that we're talking about today. And when I did it every day to people, I would get market feedback and I would work and I would craft it. So in really getting my craft out there for 200 days in a row, I created the entire I'm Hero project. So if you're wondering about how do I craft it, what do people think? This is when you actually then choose your vehicle and get it out there every day. And here's the thing. If no one was on my Facebook Live, it didn't matter. 
Why? Because I was in my zone. I was in my lane. And so for, for me, at least, that was 15 minutes of the day that I wasn't depressed, dis, I wasn't disengaged, I wasn't numb. It was 15 days. Megan, the only way I could describe it is, if, I mean, it was 15 minutes of the day. The best way I could describe it, I felt like I came up out of the water for a breath of oxygen. It's, it was like, you know, like when you imagine if you were drowning and you come up and you, you take that breath, how much you want and, and desire that breath. Like in the beginning, because it's tough, you know, when you're getting out of this little funk stage that people might get in, just to have 15 minutes a day where I felt alive again, I craved it every single day, whether people were listening or not. So this is the, they're, they're the easy practical methods, if you're listening right now, that you can start today to start moving and really cultivating your message. One of the things that's been happening in the background of this entire podcast is that I will have a question in my head and before I can answer or before I can ask it, you've just answered it for me, which was like, what are those, what are those first steps? What are those first things that people need to do? And you just, you just owned it, Chris. It was amazing. Um, so thank you for that. This is, this is what it's like to be, uh, to be in flow and, and to resonate Mm -hmm. energetically. It's awesome. Um, I've got two quick questions for you before we, we transition to uh, that last component of our interview. And, and the one question for you is who inspires you? Myself. And, and I'm not saying that braggadociously because as I'm still in, I'm 41 years old, I'm still, watch this, building a relationship with myself. And I'm in the zone of appreciating and loving myself unconditionally. And I allow who, who I am capable of being inspire me. So I write down my vision of my future expanded evolved self. And instead of modeling someone and be inspired by a Tony Robbins and doing what they're doing, I write down the vision of me in the future and I'm pulling myself to myself, right? So I use myself as an inspiration because I really, after 30, you know, because as a kid, we were connected. So, I mean, I'm, I, I just have been reintroduced to who I am after 30 years. Amazing. Best answer I've heard to that question in a really long time. Last question before we transition. How do you define health? The optimal function of your body, mentally, physically, socially, and spiritually, and it is not merely the absence of sickness or disease. Boom. You've you've clearly thought about that. (laughs) That's all I talk about. (laughs) (laughs) My favorite is when I ask health practitioners, I'm like, how do you, how do you define health? They're like, oh, that's a great question. I'm like, oh, okay, people. We've all heard that mindset has a huge influence on our ability to be effective and amplify in this world. But what if I told you your brain biochemistry, literally the neurotransmitters that are existing within your nervous system, can help amplify your mindset or your capacity to be effective? They can help accelerate your mission in the world. More and more with both my coaching clients and my patients, we end up having a conversation related to our own ability to control our nervous system through the optimization of neurotransmitters. Now, what the heck do I mean by this? The foods that you eat, the way that you think, your interaction with the world has the capacity to increase things like serotonin or dopamine, some of these really important neurotransmitters to helping you be effective and operate at your best. After listening to literally thousands of conversations with my clients and with my patients, I pulled together a very quick checklist so that you could have a better understanding of the things you're doing every single day to amplify your nervous system or downregulate it in a way that isn't necessarily serving your mission. If you want access to this information and want to learn a little bit more about how you can optimize your brain health for success, visit meganwalker.com forward slash brain health to grab your handout now. Now, back to our episode. I want to transition to uh, the last component of the interview, and I I call these our KPIs or key performance indicators. So just like we would have them in our business, I believe that we Mm -hmm. also have them in our health. And and what I want for our listeners is just to get a little snippet of what happens behind the scenes um, on a day-to-day basis with, uh, Mm -hmm. with Chris Zeno. So indulge me. Here we go. Yes. Do you have a consistent evening routine? And if so, can you share it? Yes. Um, evening routine. I sit down. It's more mental. You know, after my last meal, I, even though I might be a little bit tired, I go in my office and I write down uh, my visions for the second time. Like I write my visions in the morning, then I write them at night. The reason why I write my visions every single day is because I give myself grace for my visions to change. Because through the day, 
we have unknowns and we have experiences and it's okay to change. So I, I always keep my vision and my future uh, goals and I write the wins of the day down. I write the unknowns like this podcast was a win. So I'm always keeping in front of me that I am winning. I keep my vision and my goals in front of me. And I always write down my unknowns, like the unknowns that happen that maybe I met someone in the grocery store and, and we had a great conversation. And, you know, like, so the unknowns, I'm, I want to be aware that life is rooting for me at all times. I love it. Fiction or nonfiction, what are you reading right now? I am reading um, nonfiction. So I am actually reading uh, this. Uh, I'm reading books by uh, Esther Hicks. And I'm also reading um, uh, Dr. Joe Dispenza uh, called Becoming Super, Super, uh, Superhuman on Meditation. What is the one thing you are most consistent with with respect to your health? My routines. Um, you know, the, you know, how I eat, I'm most good. I'm, I'm routine with how I eat. I'm routine on my exercise routine. So food, food, I, I call it, you know, function food and fitness. That's because when those things are on, even when I travel, I'm my mind, my mind sharp, it's clear minded because you, you don't realize if my, if I'm, if my mind's function at 80%, that compounds over time will we could really miss out on a lot of life and amazing interactions with people. So I want to make sure that when my body's right, food, fitness, and function, then uh, I'm, I'm at my A game at all times. What is something totally badass about you that people would not otherwise know? I'm a concert pianist. I won Mr. America, Mr. Universe, and I'm a hero. I got a bunch of badass things about That's me. That's amazing. <laughs> Chris, what do you do for fun or play? Uh, what I love to do for fun is what I, uh, what my purpose is. So I enjoy like this, what I'm doing right now with you is the highlight of my day. Like I love human connection and uh, I love being able to express and experience true love now. That's like, cause I feel when I'm expressing love and what I mean by love guys, cause I know we all have different, different, what I mean by love is unconditional appreciation. Meaning that like when I could be in that state, it's like the best thing. So that's fun for me. I love watching uh, funny movies. So uh, my kids, and uh, that, that's it. I mean, I just, I, I love, I, you know, I'm, I'm really enjoying life and what it's bringing me. Last question for you, Chris, entrepreneurism. Are we born this way or do we learn to become entrepreneurs? I think when you really nail down your purpose, then you're going to do whatever it takes to, to be that quote unquote entrepreneur in what you do. Right. So I never wanted to be a chiropractor. Like that was the furthest thing from my mind. But I went through I went through a health experience called colitis. It was a health experience. It was my greatest teacher. It was the greatest gift I was given. It was the unknown. I never would have wished for anybody, but the unknown that brought me and opened up so many doors in my life. That's when I became went back to school to get my doctorate in that. And then because I had such a story and purpose behind it, I mean, right? You know what I mean? So like I was willing to do things and work harder that because it was just. So I was just so, it was just such a part of me. It was, it was just such an important message for me. Like, so uh, go full circling back to what you said, when you speak to people, you know how they're going to do well, whether it be business or even in their health by having that big, huge why, it, not, not only having a why, uh, a what, but a why. So, you know, I know what I wanted to do and I had such a strong why behind it. So, right. So I'm willing to work longer uh, put more effort in, train myself more. I'm willing to pay for coaching. I'm willing to, right? I'm willing to, because it's so important to you. It's so important to me. So I think purpose-driven entrepreneurship really is the decider of success. Amen. What a brilliant place for us to uh, to wrap this up. Chris Sano, you've had so much wisdom that you have just dialed down in this uh, this interview today. I can't thank you enough when people want to connect with you, which they will, where can we send them to learn a little bit more about what you're doing? Great. So if you go to IamHero.com, IamHero.com, I have some cool freebies for you. One is called the Hero Secret Sauce. you like that. That's basically just the characteristic traits of uh, successful heroes in history. Uh, we have three other master classes that are also there for you, such as time expansion. You know, you can't make more time, but we teach you how to expand it. I am value. A lot of times we got to get value in ourselves first in our product, service, and idea so we could communicate that to the masses for an exchange in income and value. And then I also threw on their diet hacks, you know, just uh, being in the fitness industry for so long, you know, how do I make, uh, how do I make diet and, and eating correctly consistent? I got a couple easy hacks in there for you guys as well, but they're all my gift to you. 
And uh, I want to, you know, I, if you want to keep the conversation going, uh, the best two places you can find me are on Facebook and Instagram under Dr. Zeno. I provide content for you, just like we talked about today, every single day. I have content every single day. And I personally answer all my comments and I personally answer all my message because it's very valuable to me. So if you want to keep the conversation going, you know, that's how we do it. Chris, thank you so much. This was so much fun. And there was so much wisdom in this, uh, this interview today. Thank you so much, guys. If you enjoyed what you heard, five stars for Dr. Megan and uh, comment. <laughs> Get me back. Brilliant. Check out the show notes, everybody. We've hooked everyone up with all of uh, Dr. Zeno's contact information and how you can learn more about all the cool things that he is up to. If you enjoyed our conversation and would like to hear more, head on over to Stitcher or iTunes and subscribe to the Anthropology Podcast. We would also really appreciate a quick review. When people have their health, they can change the world. Let us keep you healthy and you go change the world.